previously on Accused. I think the interview is about over. So is it fair to say that the government lied to people here? In the early years, absolutely. It seems so mundane, yet it seems so evil at the same time, or potentially evil. I don't know how much we know about the uh, radiation risk today. My husband said to me, maybe it's time to quit. And I said, I can't. We can't. We can't quit. I'm Amber Hunt, and this is Accused, the mysterious death of David Box. Larry Hicks was a healthy 33-year-old man when he awoke one day in May 1985 and headed to his job as a supervisor at National Lead of Ohio's Fernald plant. The married father of three and avid jogger had risen the ranks after working 12 years at the company. It was a solid, reliable job that provided well for his family. But on this day, not quite a year after his co-worker, David Box, apparently disappeared inside of a salt inferno, a piece of machinery malfunctioned overhead during Larry's shift, and he was doused in particles of uranium. Fun fact about uranium, it's colorless and odorless, and Larry likely didn't know how acutely he'd been exposed. His family certainly didn't. All they knew was that for days afterward... Larry felt sick and was required to undergo decontamination scrubs daily at work. That lasted four days. On the fifth day, he died. He was five months shy of 34 years old. If you've been listening to this season of Accused, wondering how on earth anyone could get conspiracy-minded enough to think the government might have helped cover up the killing of David Box, you need look no further than the case of Larry Hicks. Hicks went to work healthy one day, was drenched in uranium, and felt ill until his death five days later. It sounds pretty open and shut that the exposure and his demise were probably connected. And yet, here's the voice of a former NLO manager summing up the outcome of Larry's widow's wrongful death lawsuit. We won that case hands down. He didn't die of uranium poisoning. He died of a potassium deficiency. And we had, we had some of the best heart specialists around who, who, who made the K, our case and had convinced the jury. That's Weldon Adams. He's been one of Fernald's biggest defenders over the decades, testifying in numerous trials that you could sit right on top of a billet of uranium and walk away just fine. Uranium isn't totally safe, he concedes, but this notion that it might be responsible for anyone's ill health, well... That's just fake news. Uh, That's the way the media does. That's what sells newspapers. Horror stories sell newspapers. Tell everybody that they're dying of cancer, that they've all been killed, that there's a great government conspiracy to do them in, and they love it. Maybe it does sell newspapers. I don't know. What I do know is that when I called past employees to talk to them about Fernald, I noticed a theme in their answers. Here's a sampling. We've had, you know, higher rates of leukemia and We've had higher rates of breast cancer and kidney cancer and bone cancer and... Lung disorders and stuff, I got that. I got to go to dialysis three times a week. The doctor said, you ain't gonna live through this. This is Rex, he's my uh, cardiac support dog. They were all sick, every one of them. So which is it? Fake news or real conspiracy? When you talk to Fernald plant alumni, you have to be mindful of the type of job the worker held. I learned this the hard way during a joint interview with Bob Kispert and John Sadler. Sadler spent most of his career as a laborer. He eventually got promoted to management, but that didn't happen until after the mid-1980s when the health concerns about Fernald became public knowledge. Sadler is outspoken in his contempt for the health problems he believes the plant and the government unleashed on unwitting employees. He said he'd heard time and again, Nothing will hurt you out there unless it falls on your head. 
Kispert was in management when lax safety allegations came to light. And it turns out he sees things a bit differently than Sadler does. Well, I always like to think the best of people and that the people who were in charge were competent and knowledgeable. Now, I'd scheduled an interview with Sadler. I hadn't yet heard of Kispert, and I certainly hadn't asked him for an interview. But when I, Amanda, and engineer Phil Didion showed up at Sadler's house at the scheduled time, he said he had asked a former coworker to join us and said this friend would be able to answer all of our technical questions because this guy knew the plant inside and out. We said, sure, that's great. The more insight, the better. Kispert showed up and things at first were fine, but then something shifted. Sadler said managers knew how dangerous the work was, but didn't warn anyone. Kispert said he agreed with Sadler. Then the two talked about the lawsuits that were filed by both the area residents and Fernald employees, prompting me to ask, When these suits started filing, did the tenor inside the plant change in terms of, I mean, because some employees, you know, were were suing the company at that point. Was there tension among workers because some were on one side and others on the other? No. 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 Okay. No. It was more like the union filed a lawsuit. Well, we'll see how it uh, goes in court, you know. Yeah, that was after, after Lisa Crawford and the residents Yeah, it was the there. residents were mu- much more vocal at the time. Oh, yeah. But the DOE straight up lied about some of the... That's a harsh word. That's Kispert talking. But it, it, it is actually true, though, right? That's a harsh word. No, so I'm then not, how I'm would you characterize s- it? I'm not going to say they lied. You don't have to, I did. <laughs> but I mean, if I, but am I wrong? you asked me right, <laughs> no, I would be more That's true. That's a, a verbal take yeah. of mine more than right. an actual question. Um, what, so if it's not a lie, then what is it? That's the same question, but coming from a different <laughs> angle. No, if it's because not you're a saying lie, you wouldn't call it a lie. So what, what would you characterize it as? What are we trying to characterize here? The interview continued like this, not great, not terrible, as though we were talking past each other rather than to one another. The words he spoke sounded, in theory, like they could be responses to my questions, but they really weren't. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find level footing. I tried another approach. You guys come from a a certain background. You worked there, so your your perception is different, obviously, and the mine is your perspective. If I went to work every day and um, had been told that things were safe and then learn uh, through lawsuits that they weren't and that uh, my bosses knew that, I would be angry. I think people were. Were you? Angry, no, because uh, I, uh, I felt safe. Okay, why? Because I felt safe. I didn't feel threatened. Okay. So even though there were scientists pointing to uh, real hard violations of these standards, um, you still thought, well, they told me it's safe, so it's safe. Well, I think the interview is about over. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'm not not sure... I can't uh, continue to be grilled like this. I ask people uncomfortable questions all the time. It's my job. But usually I know when I'm asking them. This time, I genuinely didn't understand what I had asked that was offensive. From today's vantage point, it's well documented that the Fernald plant was more dangerous than employees were told. We know this to be true because the Department of Energy eventually said so. Past employees are guaranteed health screenings for life because of the workplace exposure. We'll talk about that more later, but it's called the Worker Health Protection Program. Past Fernald workers get the added bonus of free low-dose CT scans for early lung cancer screening. So when I asked about deceit, I didn't consider it a confrontational question. After Kispert said, I can't uh, continue to be grilled like this. We sat in awkward silence for a beat until Sadler interjected. 
He said that Kispert was an ally who had worked in management, and those two facts could be at odds with each other. Kispert had grown concerned in the 1970s when a number of workers reported having cancer. Kispert was there, Sadler said, when the Department of Energy sent this... Husband and wife team in to do a radiological survey on the clean side, and they found all the buildings contaminated and the grounds contaminated. So there really wasn't a clean side of the fence. There is no safe side of the fence. So I'm asking questions with that in mind. It's not intended to grill. It's, it's based on the reality of the fact that it was a dangerous work environment and people weren't forthcoming about that. So it's not, I'm not trying to be combative by any means. I'm, I just don't, I don't know how else to talk about this scenario. And I don't know how else to answer it, but I didn't feel threatened. Okay. No, I, mean, I just asked why. That's all. Now, maybe there's something wrong or deficient with me for thinking that way, but that's another discussion. <laughs> well, you read my presentation that I did down at Oak Ridge, and I said in there that everybody that worked out there during production was a walking uranium mine because you get that ingested, whether it goes in your lungs or it goes in the other parts of your body to affect your other organs. We all have it in us. And if they were processing plutonium, you got a 240,000 year half-life for plutonium and it doesn't dissolve and it doesn't go away. So anybody that died that worked out in Fernald during the production time, if they did an autopsy, they'd find something in their bodies. I feel like you guys are in two different planets. Little bit, but not not a lot. Okay. But he, like I said, he was in management, and uh, but I was out in the plant where I intermingled with all the workers and the production workers, and I'd hear them say things, and and I'd take it in, and they'd say, "Well, look at this," and and uh, there was one story about a guy that lived in Blanchester, and he was coming to work, and he's coming down from Milford area, 275. When he got to Tri-County, he sent a yellow cloud into the sky, and he followed it all the way to the plant, and it was coming from the plant. So, I mean, it, uh, contamination went a lot farther than our plant where it was and to wherever the wind was blowing it. It made it off site, that's well known. Is there, is there a defensiveness in being from management Uh, I, I said I think the interview's over. Okay. I'm getting tired. That's fine. We I'm can unlike weary. you. So uh, I got, and I need to be getting back anyway. Yeah. Be like on. I share this exchange because it's telling. There's a bizarre schism among people who believe Fernald did something wrong and people who don't, or at least dance around saying they don't. I found it maddening. These are gray areas my brain cannot reconcile. Either uranium is dangerous, or it isn't, and the government knew, or it didn't. It's amazing how fraught this issue actually is. You can pose the same question in the same words to the same person and get different answers. For example, in one trial, Weldon Adams testified that workers knew precisely how dangerous working with uranium was, and because of that, deserved no compensation for the danger they'd been exposed to. In another trial, he said they deserved no compensation because uranium wasn't dangerous at all. Adams, in particular, is amazing at this kind of doublespeak. Now, you've heard people say, and oh, the, the union people go berserk and they complain because some people have made this. I never made this statement. I've been accused of making the statement. I never made it at any time. That you could take a tablespoonful of uranium oxide in your mouth and swallow it, and it probably wouldn't hurt you. Now, I never made that statement, but the truth of the matter is that it probably wouldn't do you any damage, or at least not much damage, and let me explain why. Insoluble compounds just pass right through your digestive tract, regardless of how toxic they may be. To put that another way, I never said you could swallow uranium oxide and it wouldn't hurt you. But here's why it wouldn't hurt you if you swallowed uranium oxide. It's honestly exhausting. But here's the thing. 
cancer rates among Fernald employees are higher than the national average. The Centers for Disease Control released a National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health study in June 2013 that found more than a 50% increase in lymph and blood cancers among salaried men who worked there. Hourly workers saw a 15% greater risk of dying from cancer than the general population. Can we say for certain that increased risk is definitely because of those workers' exposure to uranium? No. Cancer, unfortunately, doesn't arrive with a telegram attached announcing just what caused it. But communities that boasted factories tied to nuclear weapons creation have been statistically shown to have higher cancer rates than areas that didn't. As scientist Stephanie Mallon said, They're showing that there are cancer clusters. They're showing that people have rare cancers living down the street from each other. This isn't just a benefit from hindsight kind of thing either. As Kispert said earlier, he and other Fernald managers started noticing high cancer rates in the 70s. By 1980, federal reports detailed equipment failures, routine leaks, and carelessness that allowed thousands of pounds of mildly radioactive uranium to escape from the plant. In the 80s, widows were filing lawsuits. Around the time the news broke that Fernald had been polluting the area with uranium dust, Union reps began protesting that the Federal Department of Energy was running health tests. Jeffrey C., a representative of the Atomic Trades Labor Council at Fernald, told the Enquirer, quote, You not only have the fox guarding the hen house out there, you also have the fox giving the headcount and the inventory. In other words, saying, All the chickens are here, there's nothing to worry about. End quote. The unions lobbied to have agencies outside of the DOE examine health concerns, and the resulting data was bleak. A 1996 study examined 1,064 deaths from 1980 to 1989. The study found an increase in deaths among hourly workers from lung cancer and respiratory disease that were linked to higher doses of radiation exposure. Weldon Adams is quoted in a news story about that study. He said it was, quote, the worst scientific study I've ever read. I still do not believe that uranium caused any cancers at Fernald. These results were cobbled up to satisfy politicians, end quote. Accused is sponsored by Policy Genius. It's already December. As much as we love getting seasonal, this month can be a bit stressful too. We've all got a long list of things to do for the holidays. If life insurance is one of the things way down on your list, Policy Genius might be able to help you cross it off. They'll find you the right life insurance at the best price and do all the work to help you get covered. Policy Genius makes finding the right life insurance a breeze. In minutes, you can compare quotes from the top insurers to find your best price. In fact, you could save $1,500 or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and red tape. So, if you need life insurance but aren't sure where to start, why not start at policygenius.com? It only takes a few minutes to find the right life insurance policy, apply, and cross another thing off your to-do list. Policy Genius. When it comes to life insurance, it's nice to get it right. Accused is sponsored by Audible. It's that incredibly stressful time of year when you're racking your brain trying to come up with thoughtful gifts for the people you care about. Well, here's something anyone will love. The gift of an Audible membership. And now is the best time to do it, with a special offer of 53% off your first three months. With Audible, you can access an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, motivation, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. I always enjoy reading a good memoir or biography at the top of a new year. One I've got my eye on right now is Jenny Lawson's A Funny Book About Horrible Things. With the convenient Audible app, you can listen on any device, anytime, anywhere, which makes it great for commuting, for the gym, or during your holiday travels. Right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. Visit audible.com slash accused or text accused to 500-500. Now is the perfect time to give the gift of Audible. Again, that's audible.com slash accused or text accused to 
500. And now back to our story. I've talked about the headlines that hit just months after David Box disappeared, but I haven't spelled out the details or the firestorm the news unleashed. The first story, the one I mentioned in episode one about how Fernald might have released uranium dust in the air, was written in a very balanced way. That is to say, it provided company officials equal space to deny the allegations. The writer even got the denial right in the lead, or the first graph of the story. We journalists are supposed to strive for balance, but this can backfire at times like when one side is providing accurate information and the other side isn't. The issue is whether uranium dust was released into the air, and that's a yes or no question. In hindsight, the company's denial didn't deserve equal space because we've learned in the intervening decades that the company was wrong. I can't fault the journalist here. The reporter did what we're trained to do. He got both sides. But stories like this one show how dependent we journalists are on people to tell the truth, especially when covering the two most secretive sectors there are, business and government. That first reporter didn't stay on the story. He was soon replaced by Ben Kaufman, the reporter you heard from in episode three. Kaufman covered the environment, but he still wasn't a uranium expert, and this stuff was doubly hard to interpret because those initial stories came from legal filings. And if you've never read a legal motion, trust me when I say they can be mind-numbingly obtuse. About those court filings, Kaufman said, Then I would read it, and then probably have to call, like, what does this mean? (laughs) I'm not a lawyer. And I didn't pretend to be a lawyer. That's a, that, honestly, that's a sign of a good reporter who's not <laughs> afraid to say, hey, I'm an idiot on this. Can you please explain it? Well, I, I, in the old bit I've written for myself so that nobody else messes it up, I say it's a perfect trade for somebody who's propelled by ignorance. When you've got a complicated story like this, figuring out the truth is tough. Fernald recruited scientists to back their version of things, publicly saying that everything was fine and using heady jargon to make the folks disagreeing with them sound like tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy theorists. A lot of those scientists were paid, and some of them worked for the very government they were defending. Not exactly a conflict-free situation. Those scientists helped keep the news stories balanced for a good while. Remember, reporters can get sued if we screw up a fact, and when the facts are this complex, newsroom lawyers and editors get nervous. They couch things. They cover their butts. I don't like jumping in and writing stories when I don't know the topic inside and out. And this is why. If you don't have a solid understanding of the matter at hand, you're left at the mercy of your sources. Not only are you forced to trust them with helping you understand what's happening, but you'd have no way of knowing if they're wrong or, worse, straight up lying. Forgive the digression, but this is why we need experienced journalists in this country. With experience comes knowledge, and with knowledge, we have reporters who parse out the facts rather than simply quote both sides. But back to Fernald. The stories as 1984 ended were both side stories, but something shifted in January 1985. That's when residents like Lisa Crawford banded together in a class action lawsuit seeking $300 million from Fernald. The lawsuit was a game changer. For starters, it introduced residents to a class action lawyer named Stan Chesley, who was great at ginning up publicity. Stanley Chesley, Stan, the only person who calls him Stanley is his wife. Uh, Stan was the sole proprietor of a, by most standards, small law firm here in Cincinnati that specialized in disasters. It was the uh, master of disaster was one of the things he didn't use these terms. But uh, there was the MGM fire. There was the Aero Air crash in Labrador. Uh, there were any number of lawsuits he filed and won uh, on uh, flawed medical devices. He basically created, in many ways, uh, the class action lawsuit for personal injuries. 
He was a personal injury lawyer, which is why the people in Cincinnati always dismissed him. Uh, well, like as an ambulance chaser right. type. Right, yeah. Uh, but he didn't chase ambulances, not unless there were a hundred of them going the same direction. And he was good at it. Chesley was from the Cincinnati area, but had a national reputation because some of those class action suits he'd handled were high profile mass disaster cases. One of his most notable cases before Fernald was the 1977 Beverly Hills Supper Club fire case in Southgate, Kentucky. 165 people died and another 200 were injured in an inferno compounded by inadequate fire exits and overcrowding. Chesley filed suit on behalf of victims and their families and eventually won them millions. I reached out to Chesley for this project, but he hasn't responded. While he's well known in Cincinnati, the only coverage I've seen of him since moving here in 2013 was when he made headlines for losing his law license in Kentucky after skimming money from clients who had won a $200 million case against the diet drug Fenfen. Chesley has been plenty vocal over the years, though, so we have audio of him talking to other reporters and for the Living History Project. The government and whoever was running the plant continued to deny, continued to deny the reality. And you could not get nothing done when you had governmental agencies and contractors saying, gee, there's no problem, it's perfect, everything's great, nobody's getting sick, there's nothing going on out here. As the Fernald headlines gained steam, Chesley was front and center, fighting hard on behalf of the workers and residents. His reputation has taken a hit because of the issues that arose a few decades later. But at this time, he was something of an Aaron Brockovich prototype. When he thought Fernald officials were lying, he said so, in front of cameras. And he apparently thought that a lot. To save everyone time, I won't slowly unfold every allegation, but here's a rundown of what was really happening at the plant. I'm including only what I found to be substantiated by multiple experts or documents. I'd like to break out of that both sides reporting and cut to the truth. Fernald managers routinely told employees they had nothing to worry about health-wise. You were more likely to get injured by getting your hands stuck in a machine than you were to be exposed to a carcinogen, they said. Workers mostly believe this, and any who might want to raise questions with outside experts feared speaking up because they weren't legally allowed to talk about their jobs. The thought of being fined $10,000 or sent to prison for five years can have a quieting effect. They didn't even talk to their families about what they did for a living. The workers who weren't suspicious didn't think twice about doing things that now sound irresponsible, like bringing their work badges home. They wore those badges in the plant, and those badges got covered in uranium dust, and then those badges went home with the workers who might slap them on the kitchen counter or bedroom dresser night after night. Inside the plant... Safety was not, safety was not a concern back then. It was production. Production was king, and safety was not, a, was not even brought into the problem, into the situation. I think this characterization from former Fernald employee Bob Neal might be a little simplistic. Fernald officials were concerned with safety and that they touted a flawless safety record and accepted bonuses when they supposedly had no injuries on the job. An article published in April 1985, 10 months after David disappeared, quotes a Fernald manager as saying the company's safety record was so good that the plant had received 69 awards for safety from state and federal agencies. In that same story, though, a union representative said the health and safety records were juked. Gene Branham, president of the Fernald Atomic Trade and Labor Council, accused NLO of taking bizarre steps to assure workers at least made an appearance at the plant, allowing them to technically claim that no one missed work due to injury. Paul DeMarco, a lawyer who worked with Stan Chesley, told us in a recent interview about one case involving a worker named Angelo Galena. They used to have these no lost time awards at Fernald. They'd get a bonus for no workers losing time. So a guy like Angelo Galena has this really bad burn, and in order to avoid losing their award, they put him up in the infirmary. 
and they would take him on a stretcher every day from the infirmary to the administrative office, set him down, and then bring him back. Another safety-related anecdote that stuck with me was a story about Senator John Glenn, yes, the astronaut, visiting Fernald. While he was there, he said an alarm went off. The alarm was meant to alert workers to contamination. Glenn said the workers responded to the alarm by simply turning it off. That's it. They turned it off and kept on working. Thrifting is fun, but spending hours sifting through the racks isn't, especially when the holidays are busy enough. My favorite shopping destination, ThredUp, makes it easy to get thrift store pricing with the convenience of online shopping. There's something for everyone at ThredUp. You can score coach handbags for $25, free people dresses for $13, Madewell jeans for $25, and even J. Crew sweaters for just 20 bucks. All items are up to 90% off estimated retail, and they're also all in high-quality condition. Some even have the tag still on. I just ordered three shirts, a gorgeous Marc Jacobs makeup bag, and a coach purse, and I saved a total of $530.95. Everything arrived to me looking like new, and bonus, I saved a ridiculous amount of time being able to shop for all of that in one place. Get started today shopping with ThredUp, and I know you'll fall in love just like I did. And just for listeners of Accused, here's a little extra holiday cheer. Get 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash accused. That's 30% off your first order at T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash accused. Terms apply. Excuse this quick break. The episode you're listening to now was released already on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash accused. You can get early ad-free episodes there, as well as bonus episodes, behind-the-scenes peeks, Q&A sessions, and even a brand new crime and journalism podcast. If you like what we do here, consider joining us over there. For this episode, we're releasing a look at the Fernald Community Alliance's expansive living history project. Again, for this content and more, support us at patreon.com slash accused. Could any of this have bothered David Box enough to complain? That's the theory his family's come to believe, but it's a tough one to prove. We do know that workers knew at least some of what was happening. They could see when alarms were ignored, and we found documentation that workers complained of radiation sickness as far back as 1976. We also found an interesting exchange from 1983. A security worker filed a written request asking that he and his peers be allowed to eat in a designated lunch area. The worker said security personnel weren't allowed to leave their posts even to eat, so they were handling potentially contaminated badges in the same place and with the same unwashed hands as where they ate their meals. The company's reply was that past experience told them there was no health risk by eating and checking badges simultaneously. The amount of contamination, if any, would be so minimal as to be negligible, the response read. In other words, even when workers asked to be allowed to take measures to safeguard their health, their requests were flatly denied. Now, residents knew very little about safety issues inside the plant. What caught their attention was the groundwater contamination. As Stan Chesley said, Fernald knew uranium in the drinking water would be problematic. And so when the plant was built, the man-made ponds nearby were lined with plastic. But the plasticized water, with weather and time, would tear. So all of the radioactive water would go right down in and go into Patty Run Creek and into the little Miami River, or the Miami River. Uh, And so what happened is it spread. It reached the well water. Across the street at the Crawford house, parents Kenneth and Lisa would ask their son what he wanted to drink. Our son, when he'd sit down to a meal, we'd say, okay, we want, you know, you got a choice. You got water to drink, milk, you got pure orange juice or pure grape juice or pure apple juice, something like that. Awful lot of times he'd said he wanted water. We said, are you sure you want water? And, and, and here he was drinking this contaminated water over there. We thought we were doing, doing the right thing. Their story mirrored hundreds of others. Eventually, 14,000 people joined Chesley's lawsuit. 
but contaminated water was just the beginning. Between September and December of 1984 alone, some 275 pounds of enriched uranium dust that was supposed to be trapped in a bag escaped because the bag had come loose. Officials said there was nothing to worry about, and a lot of workers believed them. Here's former employee Dottie Neiman. I thought it was uh, overblown by the media, and I didn't think there was really any danger for us. I was not at all concerned. But the residents' complaints were growing louder. At a community meeting, they demanded the DOE send in independent health specialists. As the lawsuit moved forward, they recruited scientists not already employed by the government to help them with the testing. In fact, several of the scientists were from other countries entirely. They were young, idealistic, and more concerned about getting the science right than playing politics. One scientist, Arjun Makajani, who had just started his own institute, was asked to estimate how much uranium had been released year by year so that the official estimates, the ones that came from the company, could be verified. He worked alongside a German scientist named Bernd Franke, whose job was then to make a model to show how the uranium would have dispersed in the atmosphere. And from that, they'd figure out how much radiation people had been exposed to. Both of those scientists are still around, still prominent in their fields, and both told me Fernald is still important to them. In a strange way, talking to them almost felt like reminiscing. I mean, obviously, it was a very seminal moment in my professional life because we had just set up this institute. I really wanted to do more environmental and health-related work. I wanted to work more independently, and so we set up this institute, and, and this was one of the jobs we had that kind of was very extraordinary and you know we weren't we didn't set up the institute to get publicity and be quoted in the papers we set up the institute to help people who had some money to pay us who wouldn't otherwise necessarily have access to independent expertise in other words they didn't work for free but they worked for pretty cheap Fernald's side had far deeper pockets. Bottom line is um, we found a couple of things that were problematic. Uh, first of all, we concluded that the actual, the best estimate that we could make of the actual releases of uranium uh, over the period were about three times the official estimate. The scientists had to rely on documents provided by Fernald to do their calculations, and at first, Fernald didn't hand over a complete set. One of Chesley's associates, Louise Roselle, actually found paperwork that hadn't initially been turned over. The more documentation the scientists had, the more precise they could get with their estimates, and as that happened, the estimates climbed higher. Here's Roselle, the lawyer. When they would monitor and the amount being released was below the detectable level. Instead of putting ND, not detectable, they grow to zero as though there was nothing coming out. And we finally got all of those records and Arjan and Baron Franke did a study um, to show you know, that the information the government was giving out was not accurate. And was that just a shortcoming of a local employee, or was the DOE aware of this? The DOE knew. The male voice was lawyer Paul DeMarco, who worked alongside Roselle. Makajani said some of the scientific calculations used at the plant were not only wrong, but there was documentation showing that the DOE knew it. So i give you the most dramatic example. In a lot of the releases were from scrubbers where they tried uh, through a wet process, you know, to scrub the uranium out of certain um, parts of the process before releasing uh, the gases up the stack. Uh, this, the estimation method uh, was scientifically wrong. 
And moreover, there was a memo in 1970 or 71 in the plant that said this estimation method, if I'm remembering the words correctly, was inherently deceptive. So they knew it was wrong. And the main, the problem was a simple one in was first level algebra, that if you have two unknowns, you have to have two equations to solve the problem. They had two unknowns and only one equation, so they assumed that the scrubbers were always operating perfectly. Whereas the op- the actual evidence from the plant was that they were often broken down and operating at v- or operating at very low efficiency. So the actual releases were much higher. Franca, who describes himself as just a little German scientist, whose recruitment on the case was pure luck, I guess said the science put forth by the government was just wrong. They conveniently ignored all the evidence that was already in the labs. Uh, they could have done this uh, themselves. These lawsuits always have to show you know, a scientific base is a number higher or lower. Uh, and was there negligence involved or gross negligence or simply ignorance? Uh, so... We could establish that there was negligence, there was gross negligence involved in in many uh, particular aspects of how they were running the facility and how they documented. Uh, So we found documents, essentially uh, reviews of equipment. One comes to my mind uh, that I think these respirators that we wear are the epitome of filth. Uh, So uh, they, they had their own quality control people saying our respirators are really, really bad. And then they didn't do very much about it. Wow. So there was there was operational negligence. There was negligence uh, uh, regarding the protection of uh, humans against the dangers of uh, the material that we're working with. And then they, when they were monitoring them, uh, they didn't do it properly. Franca and Makajani were ready to testify in the class action lawsuit filed by the residents, but the judge assigned to the case had an unusual practice of staging a sort of mini-trial when he thought a civil case might clog up his courtroom for too long. He called them summary jury trials. He would impanel real jurors who heard abbreviated versions of the case with far fewer witnesses. Then the jury would go out, have real deliberations, and bring back an advisory verdict. This is Kaufman, the reporter. He covered the resident's summary trial. The idea was that top executives of the parties involved heard that they were likelier to consider settling than going to real trial and making a real mess of his schedule. The scientist's findings were presented to Judge S. Arthur Spiegel. The government presented its own expert who said workers' health wasn't in danger. Every trial, even weird abbreviated ones, has a battle of experts. It usually comes down to which side the jurors believe. But Kaufman remembers that on at least one issue, the government was caught in a lie. It had to do with forms on which dust emissions were logged. National-led, I might add, that was backed by the federal government produced the uh, records of all these, I'll call them vents out of the buildings, but they had bags underneath made of some material that was supposed to collect the dust. And nothing was getting out. And that was part of their defense. And then Stan, or one of his, said, when did you last calibrate the meters that measured that? And the person, "Mm." turned out that the testimony ended up that they had known for years the meters were broken. And there was no way they could have measured emissions. And they'd known it. And continued to record zeros and submit those federal records. And the judge uh, urged the U.S. attorney, who was present as part of the defense team with NLO, to consider prosecution. Well, they, they, I think they dismissed that in the nanosecond, but... Uh, the judge Spiegel was angry enough. I mean, that was fraud on the court. And so, I mean, you, it, that's a moment of shock for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And 
environment. I was on that story because I was the environment reporter. And when you learn that somebody is knowingly poisoning somebody over the long term, or denying that they're doing something, and they are, it's usually shocking. The jury that heard this mini-trial ruled in favor of the residents. That prompted the company to offer a $78 million settlement, which Lisa Crawford and crew accepted. Residents were also promised years of medical monitoring. Meanwhile, workers like Dottie Neiman, who had dismissed the early news about Fernald as being overblown by the media, were starting to think differently. And it wasn't until after the class action sued and then more articles came out in the newspaper and they started exposing and explaining more of what happened that I became quite alarmed at that time. Um, you know, I said, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to our children? We raised four children here. <laughs> and it was terribly scary. It was very frightening. Now remember, all of this was beginning to unfold just months after David Box's disappearance. His family was still holding out hope that those remnants found in the salt vat weren't really his remains. First they learn of the dust releases, then they learn of the poisoned well water, then they hear about a worker who died five days after being exposed to uranium dust on the job. And those are just the public revelations. Behind the scenes, they're also hearing from David's co-workers that there is no way he put himself in that vat. They're getting anonymous notes and phone calls saying he knew about these dust releases and safety issues and was going to blow the whistle. They're hearing things like this. All right, well, they know who was the person who killed him. But apparently nobody's got the gumption to stand up and uh, say anything. It all might sound like kooky conspiracy nonsense. But once you've learned that the government has actually been caught in straight up lies, is it that hard to make the leap to murder? Next time on Accused. So I have been looking all day for D.C. Cole, a self-described investigative reporter. So Danny comes in, like a lot of people, I've got this great story, and you're going to love it, and it's going to change the world, and we're going we're gonna to get these guys. If you met him and didn't know he was a reporter, you'd think, this guy's just a getting ready to go out to uh, South Dakota for the for the bike rally out there, you know? He was just trying to, I think, exact some revenge for what the Fernald folks and the government had done to him and his family. To binge this season, go to www.wondery.com slash plus. That's W-O-N-D-E-R-Y dot com slash P-L-U-S. To support the creators of Accused Directly, go to our Patreon page where donors get bonus content and early episodes. That's at patreon.com slash accused. This is a special project from the Cincinnati Enquirer, part of the USA Today Network, narrated by Amber Hunt, produced by Amanda Rossman, engineered by Phil Didion, and edited by Amy Wilson. Intern Mark Rosenberg provided additional research. Music was composed by Andrew Higley. To look at case documents, photos, videos, and more, visit accusedpodcast.com. As noted, some audio comes from a living history project from the Fernald Community Alliance. Transcript to those interviews are available at fernaldcommunityalliance.org. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.